code two. So we'll get going. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cardiac Sciences uh, Grand Rounds. It's my very distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jasmine Grewell. She's a professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia and a member of the UBC Division of Cardiology, and she's based at the St. Paul's Hospital. She's the director of the Jasmine and Amir Virani Provincial Adult Congenital Heart Program and Provincial Cardiopsychiatrics Program. She did uh, her fellowship training in adult congenital heart disease, pregnancy and heart disease at the Toronto General Hospital and echocardiography at the Mayo Clinic. And actually, I met Dr. Grewell way back in our times in uh, McMaster University. She's very actively involved in clinical and research activities in these fields and is currently involved as a primary and co-investigator in numerous single center and multi-center research studies in the areas of congenital heart disease and pregnancy and heart disease. She's published over 100 papers to date and is currently uh, the annual meeting chair for the Canadian Cardiovascular Congress. She's an executive member of the Canadian Adult Congenital Heart Network, president of the Alliance for Adult Research in Congenital Cardiology, and co-author of the coming 2022 CCS guidelines for the management of congenital heart disease and co-chair of the 2021 clinical practice document on management of cardiac disease and pregnancy. So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Grewell with us today. And uh, Please take it over. Great, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, really happy to be here this morning with you at your Grand Rounds. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Carlos Morello um, uh, for this kind invitation. Uh, what I was asked to speak on and very excited to do so is, is around the Canadian Fontan Initiative. But what I also wanted to do in addition to that was to give you a bird's eye view of where we're at um, with this truly fascinating population. Many of you may not encounter uh, Fontan patients in your general everyday uh, practice, but I think that the, the physiology and, and the impact that that has on the morbidity and mortality in this population is, uh, is very interesting and, and very important. And I think we can learn a lot, uh, a lot from it. These are my disclosures related to this presentation. And I share this uh, uh, quote with you. I, I read this in a Jack editorial in 2008 and was struck uh, by the truth of it, frankly, uh, where, you know, it, what our patients, their families and care providers that look after patients with a Fontan population are up against. Uh, our effort to treat the most severe forms of congenital cardiovascular malformations, single ventricle type, is a continuous struggle against nature. So really, you know, we are, we are constantly sort of learning more about this population, learning about new morbidity, learning how to sort of, you know, surveil it, manage it. And so really it is a continually evolving uh, area within uh, congenital cardiology. So the univentricular heart, uh, one in every 3000 children is born in North America with a univentricular heart. This is actually similar in prevalence to cystic fibrosis, very poor prognosis with over 70% of children dying by the age of 16, uh, if unrepaired. And so just briefly, uh, so that you're aware, there's different types of the univentricular heart. Uh, and in essence, it comprises a single a physiologic ventricle. And it might be that there is a second ventricle that is small, hypoplastic, rudimentary, but either way, not large enough uh, for a biventricular repair or the underlying disease is so complex that a biventricular repair cannot be done. So an example on your left-hand side here, for example, is the double inlet and most commonly it would be the double inlet left ventricle. A single inlet example where you've got one AV valve, an example of that would be tricuspid atresia and then a common inlet. And so an example of that would be a complete AV canal defect that is unbalanced. So again, where you cannot do a biventricular repair because of the complexity of the underlying disease. So surgical progress was absolutely critical to providing any sort of semblance of hope uh, for babies and their families born with a univentricular heart. So the Fontan operation was described at similar times actually by Dr. Francois Fontan from France and Dr. Guillermo Kruzer from Argentina as a surgical treatment for uh, tricuspid atresia. And essentially since that time, 
the early 70s, there have been many modifications uh, to the Fontan circulation. And so today, uh, the most commonly performed Fontan uh, surgeries are the uh, lateral tunnel that you see here in the middle and the extra cardiac conduit. But I'm just going to highlight something. So in our practice, we would see these sort of quote unquote older versions. So what happens is that, you know, you, you have one ventricle and it's used to serve the systemic circulation. And so in order to get blood flow to the, the pulmonary circulation, uh, initially the SVC and the IVC were left intact um, to the right atrium, which was then essentially anastomosed to the pulmonary artery. Uh, and uh, this would lead to over time progressive dilatation of the, of the right atrium and issues with arrhythmia and thrombus. And we'll talk a little bit about that as I move forward. And we certainly have these patients in our practice today. And then over time that was modified to sort of streamline the blood flow into the pulmonary circulation, knowing that there was no subpulmonic ventricle and to improve the efficiency and also to reduce the risk of arrhythmia and to reduce the risk of thrombus. And so the lateral tunnel is in essence, a tunnel that is uh, you know, from the IVC through the right atrium and up into the right pulmonary artery. And I should just mention though, that prior to, uh, or, or after this RAPA Fontan, the Fontan circulation was sort of pursued in a staged approach so that there was a few palliative shunts that would occur very early on while the pulmonary circulation developed and grew. And this is really important because the Fontan circulation hinges on a healthy pulmonary circulation. So you wanted uh, nice developed pulmonary arteries, normal pulmonary vascular resistance, and I won't go through all the criteria for performing a Fontan surgery, but, but once that happened then in early childhood, the first sort of formal Fontan stage would be that of performing a Glenn shunt or a bi-directional Glenn now where the SVC is connected to the RPA and the blood flows into the RPA. Uh, in both directions uh, into the RPA as well as the LPA. And then after that, uh, with further growth of the child, the Fontan is completed and the completion involves directing all the IVC blood flow into the pulmonary circulation. And that can be done via this intraatrial tunnel through the right atrium or an extra cardiac conduit uh, so that the tunnel is outside the heart itself and then connects directly the IVC blood flow to the pulmonary circulation. And so this physiology is, is, is truly fascinating. And so here up on the normal, on the left-hand side, which you're all well, very well aware of, is a normal biventricular circulation. And so, as you know, the pulmonary circulation is connected in series to the systemic circulation. And the right atrial pressure is lower than the left atrial pressure. And the RV compliance, of course, helps with that and also helps to propel blood flow across the pulmonary circulation. In contrast, in the Fontan circulation, you do not have a subpulmonic ventricle. And as I've just shown you, the IVC and SVC are connected directly into the pulmonary circulation and you have increased systemic venous pressures. And this increase in systemic venous pressure, as well as venous contractility, help to uh, push blood flow through the pulmonary circulation, which is why having a low pulmonary vascular resistance is so important. And then some post-pulmonary capillary energy is also harnessed to sort of pull that blood through. Now, what happens over time is that the pulmonary vascular resistance does go up. Uh, so that there is increasing systemic venous pressures. But of course, there's only a, a window within which the spontan circulation can work. And over time, you can have a, an increase in those systemic venous pressures and systemic venous congestion. So that the major bottleneck when it comes to the Fontan circulation really sits within the pulmonary vasculature. So that if that continues to rise, the increase in systemic venous congestion results in that downstream congestion or upstream congestion and a downstream reduction in blood flow or cardiac output. And, and it's very important that every sort of part of the circulation is pristine so that it's important that the pulmonary vasculature, the impedance is low, but it's also important that the, the venous uh, or the systemic atrial pressures are low. So you don't want AV valve, systemic AV valve regurgitation or stenosis, systemic ventricular dysfunction. And, and all of those things we, we, we do sort of regular surveillance for, but the major issue is around the pulmonary vasculature and that uh, upstream congestion. And it's those changes that actually impact the morbidity and mortality that we see in the Fontan population. I've really simplified it here, but that is sort of the crux of the issue. 
And so the ventricle, the single ventricle, the systemic ventricle, it is, it's very important. It is, is part of the engine of the Fontan circulation, but it functions within certain confines. So of course, if your ventricular function is low, uh, that is not a good thing. It affects the end diastolic pressures. It affects the, the blood flow through the pulmonary circulation and makes it difficult for the Fontan circulation to work. But in general, you can see that as the ejection fraction of a ventricle improves or increases, I should say, it doesn't have a huge impact on the output. So really the limitation, again, I show you this to highlight that with increasing pulmonary vascular resistance, regardless of where your ejection fraction sits, unless it's very low, uh, you know, increasing it from 45 to 50 to 60 isn't going to have a huge impact on the overall output because in the setting of a high PVR, the bottleneck really sits at that, at that pulmonary circulation level and not with the ventricle. Um, I show you this just to highlight some of this, uh, the, the work around the ventricle when it comes to the Fontan circulation. So one of the things to recognize is that uh, when an individual or a baby is born with a univentricular heart, all of that blood flow is seen by that single ventricle. So what you end up with is a very volume overloaded, distended, and overgrown ventricle. And then over the course of a few years, you have a few palliative shunts, and then you have your Glen, uh, which reduces some of that uh, preload to that ventricle. And then the Fontan, of course, reduces it further. So you have a ventricle that was initially overgrown, overstretched, that is now preload starved. So this sort of sets up the ventricle for uh, suboptimal function over time, where it uh, itself develops diastolic dysfunction, which in fact is the larger issue in the Fontan circulation. It's the minority of patients that you can see here that actually develop ventricular dysfunction. And so what you've got on the top left here in the dark is, uh, so these are all Fontan patients, pre-op and then follow-up, had cardiac catheterizations and imaging every five years. And the dark bars are morphologic left ventricle in the Fontan circulation, and the light bars are the morphologic right ventricle. So you could have either ventricle uh, at serving as a single ventricle. And you can see that over time, especially if you've got a morphologic left ventricle, the quote unquote ejection fraction remains relatively stable over time. Uh, the right ventricle, if you happen to have a morphologic right ventricle, you can see that that ejection fraction uh, can decline over time, mostly because that morphologic right ventricle is not uh, set up to be serving the systemic circulation. But the, the larger issue really is around increasing end diastolic pressures uh, over time after the Fontan population. You see that the end diastolic volume drops, as I've already described, uh, from that uh, very preload loaded ventricle to a, a now deprived ventricle where the volumes are reduced, but the ventricle again uh, is, is not uh, sort of developed so that it's not used to that. And you see that the end diastolic pressures increase over time and that becomes a problem uh, with the Fontan circulation as well and does not help with, uh, with the pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary blood flow. So moving on from that, uh, this particular study really highlights the uh, improvements that have been made from a surgical perspective when it comes to the Fontan operation. This is 18 years of data from 771 patients that underwent the Fontan surgery over three different time eras. They divided these time eras based on changes in clinical practice over those times. And you can see that overall the mortality less than 30 days within the time of Fontan completion was 3.5%. And in the most recent era, 1.2%. So there has been a steady improvement in terms of the actual in-hospital mortality related to the Fontan surgery. And the other thing that I'd also like to point out to you is hospital stay greater than 14 days in an earlier era, as high as almost 50% where uh, children were staying more than 14 days in hospital and uh, dropping down to 20%. And again, uh, better now, this is still data from 2003 to 2009, so not our most contemporary data. Uh, and this is, I, I show you this data because it is the largest cohort that has looked at this specific question. Uh, the, there's been a lot of uh, important and interesting information that has come out of the Australia, New Zealand, Fontan registry. And so this particular study that was published in 2014 essentially looked at 1,006 survivors of the Fontan uh, surgery out of 1,063. Um, and essentially what this shows us that 
they, they compare the different, uh, the main Fontan types. And so I showed you the atriopulmonary Fontan, which is a sort of quote unquote, older, less efficient version. And here you've got these broad dashed lines here. And then the extra cardiac and lateral tunnel up here with the solid and smaller dashed lines. And you can see that the survival is actually better in the more contemporary Fontan population and survival 25 years out from the Fontan surgery with the atriopulmonary uh, Fontan is in the order of about 70% uh, at 20 years in terms of survival itself. This is a more recent uh, study that was published by the same group in 2018, also looking at outcomes uh, post-Fontan procedure, but a bit unique in that it includes just patients with the lateral tunnel and extra cardiac Fontan, and uh, essentially after the age of 16. So taking all those individuals that survived up until the age of 16 and looking at what their outcome was. And so this is really the population that we're seeing in our adult congenital clinics, 18 and above, 683 patients. And you can see that at 20 years of age, that survival is 96%, 30 years of age, uh, 90% and by 40 years of age, 80% of Fontan patients are surviving. Um, it's hard to make much of this 50 years of age uh, group. Again, the number of patients in this, uh, in this cohort is very small. Uh, and also this, these patients have sort of lived through a time period where our sort of surveillance and interventions uh, were not what they are today. So, you know, when I get asked by patients, what does my outlook look like when they're sitting at the age of 35 and doing really well with no sort of major uh, complications of their Fontan circulation? It's a hard question to answer because we don't actually have, have all the answers. When we look at freedom from any adverse event, so when we think about um, sort of major comorbidity uh, and, and mortality in this patient population, death, uh, transplantation, Fontan takedown or conversion, which I'm not going to talk too much about at all, NYJ class three or four symptoms, uh, issues with the lymphatic system, so protein losing enteropathy, uh, sustained, uh, ventric or sustained uh, supraventricular arrhythmias, and thromboembolism. So the freedom from serious adverse events is 40% at 40 years of age. So by 40 years of age, uh, at least 60% have had some comorbidity or mortality related to their Fontan circulation. So a very, very morbid group of patients. So I show you this just to sort of highlight the things that um, as an ACHD clinic, we are, are looking for in this patient population. What our surveillance includes is looking for um, uh, complications that might uh, uh, affect the Fontan circulation itself. So that might affect the Fontan flow. Examples of that are, is a patient developing significant ventricular dysfunction that's going to affect Fontan flow, significant AV valve regurgitation, recurrent arrhythmia, which is not well tolerated by a patient with a Fontan circulation. So these things that can, that can complicate things and, and make it difficult for the Fontan circulation to function effectively. And at the same time, we're also looking for early evidence of Fontan failure. So it is not feasible for us to perform a cardiac catheterization on these patients every year to see what their Fontan pressures are. But we can uh, look at their exercise capacity on a regular basis and see if there's any more than expected decline in the exercise capacity. We can look for evidence of early kidney dysfunction, liver dysfunction. Is there evidence of protein losing enteropathy? Um, and uh, all of these things may serve as a marker of a failing Fontan circulation and might be a trigger to look for uh, underlying issues with the Fontan. Is there narrowing in the Fontan circulation? Uh, is the pulmonary vascular resistance gone up higher than expected? And there are certain things that we can do to intervene. But again, this is where the research is sort of expanding, where our knowledge gaps are, where we need to look for more ways of sort of uh, increasing, reducing the morbidity and, and, and increasing the survival of this patient population. So here I sort of show you uh, from a pharmacologic perspective, some of the things that we do, can do, um, and from a surgical perspective as well. And so you can see here in the dashed red lines are areas of where we can possibly intervene. So let's start here. I think you can see my arrow. Um, this is the pulmonary circulation. And this is one area where we can 
intervene if you see that there's increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. I've already pointed out that this tends to be the major bottleneck uh, in this population in terms of physiology. And so if the pulmonary vascular resistance is coming up, can we bring it down and improve uh, the Fontan flow? And so as you're all aware, there's a number of pharmacologic agents that we can use to uh, help bring down pulmonary vascular resistance. And so commonly in this patient population, we can use uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors and dethylene receptor antagonists. And there are a number of studies, small studies, I'm not gonna go through all of these today, that have been looked at in the Fontan population that have shown that with the use of pulmonary vasodilator therapy, we can improve exercise tolerance, we can improve NYJ class status, improve six minute walk tests, reduce Fontan pressures. But in these small studies, of course, don't see any change or improvement in uh, survival. And so that's one area, and it definitely requires further study and is the subject of ongoing study. And then moving down the circulation, you think about the pulmonary veins, is there any obstruction, anything surgical that needs to happen from that perspective? And, and also the pulmonary arteries themselves, are they distorted, are they kinked? Is there something that we can do from an interventional perspective there to improve the flow um, through the Fontan? The AV valve, is there significant regurgitation? Um, you know, will diuretics or after load reduction help? Likely not. Uh, but, you know, do we need to consider a, a, an, um, an atrioventricular valve repair or replacement? And certainly there have been studies that have shown us that the outcomes are worse when Fontan patients have significant AV valve regurgitation, but studies have yet to show us that actually intervening uh, will make a difference. And then as you move forward to the systemic ventricle, as I've said to you, it's in the minority of patients where you see uh, systolic ventricular dysfunction um, uh, in this patient population. But if you do, and that is the issue uh, with the Fontan circulation failure, the ventricle is playing a huge role. And that's where we look at sort of our common treatments for ventricular dysfunction, which haven't been shown to make a difference and haven't been well studied because of the heterogeneous nature of the population. But, you know, we look at diuretics, we look at beta blockers, we look at after load reduction, definitely in this patient population when ventricular dysfunction is an issue. But again, if if you've got a quote unquote normal Fontan ventricle, none of these agents in terms of improving contractility, reducing heart rate, reducing afterload are going to make a big difference when we know that uh, at the crux of it, again, the bottleneck sits within the pulmonary vasculature. And then when you're moving back into the venous system, um, you know, it's very important to look at the IVC, SVC, make sure that there's no issues, again, with narrowing, and of course, at the Fontan itself, and sometimes there can be kinks at the anastomotic site, thrombus that is affecting Fontan flow, so all of these things need to be looked at uh, and, and are a part of our sort of routine surveillance when it comes to this patient population. I'm just going to cover... Um, uh, a couple of things that can sort of lead to or accelerate Fontan failure uh, very briefly. So that, you know, if you see a Fontan patient coming through the emergency department, and an example is an arrhythmia. So atrial arrhythmias are, are common in the Fontan patient population uh, related to, you know, uh, the previous surgeries, scar related to the previous surgeries, uh, related to, you know, in the setting of a right uh, atrial PA Fontan, atrial dilatation, as I showed you. And so our, our, our goal is always to restore patients into a normal sinus rhythm, you know, for example, with cardioversion. I'm not going to get into how we do that in, in any kind of detail. Uh, but, you know, and then, of course, uh, pharmacologic therapy. And if all that fails, then ablation is something that is more and more pursued in this patient population, albeit it, it is very complex. And I'm not an electrophysiologist, but I certainly talk to my electrophysiologist colleagues about this all the time. And it, it is not simple, but it is definitely something that uh, many sites are doing. And so this particular study looked at 60 ablations in 42 patients with an atrial pulmonary Fontan, so the older style Fontan. And you can see that what they've done here is essentially um, divided the groups up into uh, the far left where all tachycardias were ablated, at least one uh, was, uh, was ablated and no tachycardias were ablated. And looking at the blue was sort of the initial uh, arrhythmia score, sort of the, 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 the burden of the arrhythmia. And you can see when all tachycardias were ablated, not surprisingly, that three to six months out and then 12 months out that there was a sustained reduction in the arrhythmia score, suggesting that even in this complex population that if you can get at the tachycardias and ablate them, that the outcome is quite good in terms of keeping the arrhythmias at bay for a period of time, albeit 12 months is short. Um, and we know that these arrhythmias can definitely reoccur. 
And if at least one of them was ablated, again, you can see that there was a reduction at three to six months and 12 months with the arrhythmia score. If no tachycardias were ablated, you still see a bit of reduction at three to six months. Um, and this is sort of attributed to the fact that perhaps there was some substrate modification in that group, or that perhaps there was some further escalation of pharmacologic treatment. But again, I show you this to highlight that ablation is something that should absolutely be considered when recurrent arrhythmias are an issue in this patient population because they are are not well tolerated uh, and, and sort of consistent or conducive, I should say, to good Fontan uh, blood flow. And this is a similar study, but this time looking at the more contemporary uh, TCPC or that cable pulmonary connection, so lateral tunnel or extra cardiac. And it was 57 ablations in 52 patients. And you can see that the arrhythmia score, uh, of course, in the no recurrence group over 24 months out, small population over 24 months out, but at that three to 12 and 12 to 24 marks that the arrhythmia score remains quite low. Um, and then of course, in patients with recurrent arrhythmia, uh, you, you see this sort of decline in the arrhythmia score. It's not significant, uh, but again, uh, these are patients who have recurrent arrhythmia. And so oftentimes you have to go in and try again. And with this sort of more contemporary, I should just mention contemporary Fontan population with the lateral tunnel or the extra cardiac specifically, access is a major issue. You get into that tunnel from the venous side um, and accessing the heart itself might mean that you have to get through a leak or a fenestration that sits within the Fontan or that you need to um, uh, uh, actual puncture the, the Fontan itself, or you have to go um, uh, retrograde through the aorta. And so the, the approach is not, uh, is not straightforward and, and, and sort of adds an additional complexity to this already complex ablation. Um, I mentioned to you about exercise capacity. So I'm gonna uh, move on to this where these are sort of screening for things that might signal that there's some Fontan circulation dysfunction. And so here you can see um, there was 53 patients that underwent uh, regular exercise or cardiopulmonary stress testing as many of our patients do, and this is part of the surveillance protocol. And you can see that there is overall sort of a predictable decrease in peak VO2 of about 2.7% per year. So you're keeping an eye on this. And if you see that the exercise capacity has reduced more than that um, and on a consistent basis, then you're gonna to wanna to go looking for any issues with the Fontan circulation. And what we've also learned is that the, um, the uh, reduction in exercise capacity is more pronounced among those, again, with a morphologic right ventricle and more pronounced among those with an older style of Fontan. So that if you have a morphologic left ventricle or more contemporary Fontan circulation, you have a sort of protective um, uh, effect in terms of exercise capacity and other things as I've already shown you. Uh, the other thing that we screen for, and again, I'm just giving you a bird's eye view of some of the things that we encounter in this patient population, uh, is issues around lymphatic system failure. So with this chronic systemic venous congestion, uh, you do see an increase in lymphatic production, and you can also see um, uh, issues with drainage from the thoracic duct. And so that can lead to protein losing enteropathy and less commonly plastic bronchitis. And in the more contemporary Fontan population, this is again, the New Zealand Australia data out of 1,561 patients, 55 patients developed protein losing enteropathy or plastic uh, bronch bronchitis. So approximately 5% at 30 years and 7.4% at 35 years. So it's not the most sort of common complication, but it's definitely um, can be very devastating. So that five years post diagnosis of any of these two, you can see mortality um, upwards of 30%. And, and past that, uh, you kind of, you, you see a stabilization so that at 10 years, you see a survival uh, of 65%, so freedom from death or transplantation of 65% at 10 years as compared to 70% at five years. And that is related to all of the interventions that we have for protein losing enteropathy, um, as well as the pharmacologic management that you can see the stability occur. But then again, at 15 years, the freedom from death or transplant is 43%. 
And so I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Suffice to say, when you see protein losing enteropathy, you have to confirm the diagnosis um, and use our pharmacologic management, which can, which can include sildenafil, budesonide, heparin. Um, you wanna make sure that there's dietary modifications. You may use diuretics. But the other thing is really look for hemodynamic restrictions. Are there issues with the Fontan circulation? Should you be creating a fenestration to offload that venous system? You know, should there be thoracic duct decompression? You know, in the case of an older Fontan version, should there be a revision? Again, this is a subject of an entirely different talk, but there is sort of a, a, a surveillance protocol that we have. And again, uh, interventions and, and, and pharmacologic management when it comes to these diagnoses. The other thing that we screen for um, is thromboembolism. And so thromboembolic events are, are not uncommon in the Fontan population. But the other thing to consider uh, outside of that is thromboembolism within the Fontan circulation itself. So within the extracardiac conduit, the lateral tunnel, the pulmonary circulation, and what does that mean? And so um, we conducted a study looking at 67 Fontan patients who underwent uh, uh, imaging uh, using CT or MRI looking for Fontan uh, thromboembolism. And essentially, what you can see is that, uh, and, and this is consistent with other data that's uh, also come out, uh, that uh, of that 67 patients, there were 15 patients that had Fontan circuit thrombus, and 40% were clinically silent, so that were picked up uh, based on uh, CT surveillance or MRI surveillance, and 60% had a clinical manifestation. Some of these patients were unstable, four specifically were treated with thrombolysis, five were clinically uh, stable, and of the clinically silent, some were already on anticoagulation, others were not. The, the point is not to go through all this in finer detail, except to say that Fontan thromboembolism within the circuit can develop um, and it can be silent. And so we need to be sure to be looking for it uh, on a routine basis. And echocardiography is not sufficient because we cannot necessarily see the Fontan circulation itself with um, the resolution that's required to pick up thrombus. And the other thing to point out is that Fontan circuit thrombus is associated with adverse outcomes, specifically heart failure, transplant, um, and, uh, and, and uh, death. And so we, again, need to be looking for this and it can be a harbinger of adverse outcomes or a marker of, of outcomes. And so that you need to, again, go looking for issues when you see this. What about anticoagulation in the Fontan population? There seems to be a sort of, um, uh, biphasic, if you will, uh, risk of uh, uh, thromboembolism. So very early after Fontan repair within six months, there's a high risk of thromboembolism. And so anticoagulation is suggested. After six months, you know, less so, but between six months and adulthood, you really need to sort of look at the risk uh, of thromboembolism as it relates to atrial arrhythmias, history of thromboembolism, and of course, the presence of a mechanical valve will push you to anticoagulate. Other potential risk factors, such as ventricular dysfunction, fenestrations, complex repairs, might push you to sort of pursue full anticoagulation. If there's no risk factors and the patient is quite young, you may elect to do just antiplatelet therapy. But in the sort of uh, other end of the spectrum in, in, in adulthood, if there's no risk factors, you may still elect to pursue full anticoagulation. Regardless, at the very minimum, you're going to have all of your patients on an antiplatelet agent and then look for reasons to anticoagulate while balancing their bleeding risk. And again, the data is equivocal when it comes to whether or not in adults, antiplatelet or anticoagulation uh, with uh, warfarin as an example is superior. And the, the last two things that I wanna mention in terms of screening are related to extracardiac organ dysfunction. So Fontan associated kidney um, uh, disease is something that we're learning more about. There are, of, of course, the, the acute hits on the kidney that we see with repeat surgery, cardiac events, and nephrotoxins. And then, of course, the chronic risk factors that relate to the circulation itself and other comorbidities that might develop, such as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and smoking. Um, and so all of these things uh, we are learning can lead to a progressive decline in the kidney function. And, and the other thing that we're learning um, from our group, as well as others, is that perhaps the way we measure kidney function in terms of estimated GFR using the EPI or MDRD equations is probably not ideal in the Fontan circulation. 
we looked at a group of Fontan patients and estimated their GFR um, as you would in the normal population, quote unquote, and also measured it directly um, with DTPA uh, dynamic imaging and found that uh, estimated GFR routinely underestimated, or sorry, overestimated renal function, so that we are not picking up patients that actually have a reduction in GFR, albeit mild. And so we're screening these patients regularly, but our screening methods usually using our usual techniques of estimated GFR are probably not ideal. Um, as we are overestimating their renal function. And in fact, other most recent studies have shown that cystatin C estimated GFR is probably a more reliable way of, of uh, looking at kidney function. And so here at St. Paul's Hospital with our Fontan population, cystatin C um, estimated GFR is a way that we're screening patients' uh, renal function. And the other thing that our group and others are finding is that there is evidence of subclinical kidney dysfunction. And so this was the focus of a um, uh, multi-center study uh, where we looked at, again, subclinical kidney dysfunction and found that uh, an important proportion of patients actually have a significant uh, increase in urine ACRs and 24-hour um, uh, protein uh, in the urine, suggesting that there is evidence of subclinical dysfunction likely related to uh, venous congestion as well as uh, reduced cardiac output. And the last thing that I want to mention to you in terms of screening for subclinical um, uh, Fontan circulation dysfunction uh, is Fontan associated liver disease. I cannot do this topic any justice uh, with one slide, but I want to just highlight and bring this to your attention that over the course of a individual's life living with a Fontan circulation, you see progressive fibrosis of the liver, uh, advanced fibrosis as they uh, become an adult, and then developing cirrhosis, portal hypertension in later years. Uh, and then in, in a lower number of cases, not any more than 1%, we're also screening for hepatocellular carcinoma. So the hepatologist is critical to our multidisciplinary team when looking after these Fontan patients. And there are many ongoing studies in this area. There is some evolving consensus around how surveillance should take place in these patients. What we are learning is that our routine way of um, screening for cirrhosis in terms of blood work, liver ultrasound are not adequate in this patient population, and that um, uh, elastography, MRI, CT of the liver are required um, at varying intervals to be screening for advanced fibrosis uh, and uh, cirrhosis. And that likely the gold standard, as in many other cases though, but truly with Fontana associated liver disease, is biopsy because our imaging often does not pick up cirrhosis that is picked up uh, by biopsy. But even again, with biopsy, we can miss uh, spotty sort of spots of fibrosis, advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. So anyways, this is an evolving field uh, and, and, and very important in terms of the Fontan circulation. And when, when, when we've sort of looked at these patients and, and, and they've gone on to develop Fontan circulation dysfunction, protein losing enteropathy that is uh, not amenable to surgical or, or pharmacologic management, or a patient has an older style Fontan with significant AV valve regurgitation as NYHA class three or four, there are many sort of presentations. But at the end of the day, when we're thinking about Fontan circulation failure, we don't call it heart failure because that's not what it is then we are needing to look at uh, transplant. And so to date, Fontan patients have uh, been uh, sort of the minority when it comes to congenital heart patients that are being transplanted. That is changing. We do know that in the overall congenital heart disease population that survival post-transplant, heart transplant is similar um, to uh, other groups of cardiac patients that are being transplanted. And that long-term, the survival post-heart transplant is actually better in congenital heart patients. Again, these are all comers. But when we look at transplantation in the Fontan population, uh, there are many things that need to be considered. And this is truly an evolving field and we are making progress. And more and more Fontan patients are being referred for transplant and being considered for transplant. And so the, the issues or the problems, and so this is a... Um, uh, from a uh, 
article that will be published in an upcoming single ventricle focus issue in CJC. The, the problems are the comorbidities that, that uh, we see in the spontan population that I've outlined some of them for you already. And then what is the optimal timing for referral? So it has been that we have referred these patients late um, and, and that's been an issue. So we're referring patients earlier. And so there's been many advancements. So the one year survival has improved in carefully selected Fontan children and, and adults. So 90% for children and 80% for adults. So we're doing better. We're seeing that things like protein losing enteropathy and plastic bronchitis are improving post-transplant. We've made revisions to our criteria, which has helped. And so the challenges uh, remain, and that is that um, early Fontan failures not rescued by heart transplant, rate, rate, late referral is an issue. Um, and uh, we need more transplant centers that have the expertise or the ability, or we need to refer to uh, a few sort of expert centers where a combined heart liver transplant can be undertaken when needed. This is a huge area of, of debate and controversy. Um, and again, mechanical support options are uh, limited in this patient population. So in this last little bit, I'm just going to uh, go over sort of some of the Canadian Fontan initiatives. You know, what we're really wanting to do is sort of provide holistic care. These are patients who are uh, born with this condition and survive into adulthood. And so not only are they dealing with sort of the multiple comorbidities that they face, as I've outlined here below, but also all of the things that, you know, they're trying to live a very complete life. They want to travel, have relationships, go to university, considering careers. And so balancing all of that um, is not an easy task for these patients and their families. And so we, um, as a group across Canada, from a pediatric and adult perspective, uh, have set up a Canadian Fontan registry that is now underway um, that involves, involves many pediatric and adult sites um, across Canada. And um, essentially, this has allowed us to do many things. And it has allowed us to sort of take a tally of the kind of care we're providing across the country. And so as an example, there's 15 ACHD programs in Canada, and this represents data from 13, looking to see what kind of services are provided at our clinics. Um, and who the partners are. And some are very appropriate. And other things like formal Fontan Clinic at two sites, you know, we need to do better than that. Transition programs in 10 sites, well, that's not, that's not bad. Um, when you look at psychology, two sites have formal psychology, so 15%. So with this, we're able to sort of identify where we can do better in terms of providing very holistic Fontan care. Canadian Fontan initiatives, some of which are being sort of enabled by our Canadian Fontan registry, include these specialty clinics. Sick Kids has one, for example, um, uh, and uh, a complex electrophysiology laboratory. So Dr. Paul Carey has established this at the Montreal Heart Institute, where patients with congenital heart disease and complex arrhythmias can be referred for some of this complex ablation work. Here at St. Paul's, we've set up a Fontan biobank, which will be multi-center, and again, a part of the Canadian Fontan patient registry, patient and family education, peer support, novel exercise regimens, Dr. Andrew Mackey, um, in Alberta has set up a beautiful randomized study looking at novel exercise regimens, mental health, pharmacologic uh, therapies, uh, cyst devices, heart liver transplant, all part of the work that is being undertaken by this group um, across Canada. So the mission of the Canadian Fontan Registry is to create a comprehensive lifespan registry of Fontan patients living in Canada. There is 500 patients enrolled to date. The vision is to support Canadian and international research collaborations that, of course, ultimately improve the, live, the lives of Fontan patients. This just sort of gives you um, an idea of what the, um, what the actual uh, administrative side of the, of the uh, registry looks like. We have a steering committee. Um, and adjacent to that, we have an advisory committee that includes patients and parent advocates. And so you can see that from the care provider researcher perspective, uh, there are a number of sort of um, deliverables. And from a patient and family perspective, the goals are really peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, sort of supporting a Fontan website, Fontan education days, and looking at input from uh, patients and their families with respect to patient reported outcomes, quality of life, and what they wanna see in terms of research. The steering committee includes an adult um, uh, cardiologist, which is myself, pediatric, Dr. Dallaire from uh, Quebec, and then of course, a number of other individuals sit on the steering committee from across the country. Um, 
This is, you can refer your patients to this. This is a Canadian Fontaine website that serves as an educational resource for patients, families, and healthcare providers. It also provides patients an opportunity to sign up for different research initiatives across the country. There's also a phone application. And this is our upcoming Fontan Patient Education Day that's a virtual event on April 24th that we've had a huge amount of um, interest in uh, and uh, where really it's patient driven and supported by healthcare providers. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any further questions about anything that I've presented, please reach out to me. I've got my email there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Grewell. That was great. Um, I'm looking at the chat and going to see if there's any questions, but so let me ask you something. Uh, and, well, you know, I'm an EP guy, so that's the only thing I can ask around here. But uh, I, why is it that both with uh, the atrial pulmonary, well, I was able to figure out what was the real prevalence of atrial tachycardia, depending on whether you do extra cardiac lateral or atrial pulmonary shunts. I would have expected that those that are extra, extra, you know, cardiac would have less incidence or prevalence. And why is this not the case? No, it, it absolutely is the case. And so, so I think I didn't show you a comparison um, with the burden of, of atrial arrhythmias between the different Fontan types. Um, and so, as you point out, you're absolutely correct. The burden of atrial arrhythmia is definitely greater than the uh, in the atrial pulmonary fontan circulation. And that is one of the reasons or the, the driver behind, you know, sort of this modification going from the RAPA fontan to the extracardiac and lateral tunnel. But it doesn't mean that the sort of more contemporary um, extracardiac or lateral tunnel are sort of exempt from having arrhythmia. So we definitely still see arrhythmia in that patient population, but at a lower prevalence than in the atrial pulmonary. Okay, so when you say early referral to try to detect early Fontan failure, what exactly do you mean and how do we identify this group that is going to really not do that well? Yeah, so I think um, we talk about, assuming you're referring to early referral for transplantation. And so um, there should be a, a close relationship between the ACHD um, program or clinic and the heart failure clinic. And so some sites have a combined ACHD heart failure clinic. Um, our group, for example, is setting one up. Toronto has one. Uh, I know there's many others, but, and others may not have a combined clinic, but have a close relationship. And the idea is with the sort of surveillance, if you're seeing that there's a progressive reduction in exercise capacity um, or, you know, worsening NYJ class symptoms, you should have a low threshold to refer to the heart failure program. So it used to be that heart failure programs would say like, ah, why are you referring this patient? You know, they don't meet the, the VO2 of less than 14 for consideration of transplant. We're applying the same criteria that we would um, to the general population for heart failure referral to the Fontan po patient population. But those same criteria don't apply. And in fact, because these are younger patients and because they've been living with this um, circulation for so long, it can be quite slow and it can be um, not that apparent that in fact they're running into issues until they kind of quote unquote crash. And so, so, so you're screening for, you know, sort of progressive symptoms, you're screening for reduction in exercise capacity. If you see that there's progressive liver fibrosis or cirrhosis, that should be a trigger to refer to your transplant colleagues and they can think about whether or not a liver is needed, a liver heart is needed, or maybe just a heart is needed because we also know there's some data to suggest that if you transplant the heart, depending on the changes you're seeing in the liver, there can be reversal of that. And so, and, and what we're seeing now is that our heart failure colleagues are definitely more receptive to seeing these patients earlier because they, they, they do better. Now, you did mention this subclinical kidney uh, dysfunction. And uh, do you treat those with, you know, ACE inhibitors or something to prevent proteinuria? Is there a role for that? Yeah, so these, so doing this study was a bit of, was, was fantastic in that we were, we learned about this, but we don't have an intervention. So, so um, one of the studies that we just started is looking at um, uh, ACE inhibitor therapy in these patients. But again, um, we're not sure that it's going to make a difference. It's a pilot study. Because again, as I explained, the bottleneck is really sits within the pulmonary vasculature and, and, and that pulmonary, uh, that systemic venous congestion and the renal congestion. And so 
it may not be that the answer is ACE inhibitors, but the answer is looking at Fontan pressures and intervening from that perspective. So looking at pulmonary vasodilator therapy to reduce systemic venous congestion, and does that help? And the other thing is also now we're following these patients out. So sure, we're seeing that they have increased urine protein. We're seeing that their EGFR is reduced. And there's been some studies that have showed, of course, that the EGFR as measured by Cystat and C anyways, is associated with adverse outcomes, but the urine ACR, we don't know. So we first need to see whether in fact, you know, screening for this is great. We're seeing that it's abnormal. Does it have an impact on the outcomes? And then, you know, what kind of interventions would, would help? But I'm not sure that ACE inhibitors will be the answer. And so a lot of this is kind of like functional physiology and is there a role for like, you know, functional MRI and functional CT to try to track these people and identify, you know, these systemic issues with uh, pulmonary uh, venous uh, systemic issues. Uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to go is, you know, is there a way of screening these people earlier with functional imaging and then trying to intervene earlier? Yeah, so, so one of the things um, that we're just getting up and going between our sites <clears throat> Um, and uh, site in the States is looking actually, so not MRI, but by echo, because I'm an echo person. And there is some sort of functional quote unquote MRI data out there. But for example, with the kidneys, looking at the um, uh, renal venous Dopplers and actually Svet, um, who I think is a, was a fellow with you and then a fellow with us. Uh, it was him who got me thinking about this. Um, and uh, looking at the sort of um, dynamics, the, the flow dynamics as it relates to the renal venous system and, and looking to see if there's changes in those patients who have more congestion than less. And is that another marker of, um, again, circulation dysfunction? And can, can we use that to screen patients as well? So uh, that is sort of an evolving area, but definitely one of interest. And I know many other people are looking at that as well. Well, the good news is we're getting Svet back soon, so hopefully he can do yeah. some of that. He's, he's a great guy. We're very lucky. Well, I don't know if there's any other questions here. Uh, I don't seem to see anything I else. Think Dr. Lyons. Kristen. Yeah, sorry. I have a question. My name's uh, Kristen. Thank you for your talk. I'm actually one of the heart failure doctors. I'm not a congenital physician. I have two questions. Um, number one, when you talk about exercise testing in these patients, are you doing a uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. And that's what we've been doing here to follow them in our transplant clinic, rather than say an easier to get and not as invasive six minute walk and you're shaking your head. So I guess the answer to that is yes. Yes, yeah. And yeah, then yearly, oh, yearly or every two years, we're doing definitely doing cardiopulmonary stress tests on these patients. And what percentage, um, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, percentage drop in uh, VO2 would be significant because, you know, they, it will go up and down and you want to make sure it's the maximal test, et cetera. Right. So if we take, um, so as you know, I, and I showed some data that shows that we know there's sort of a, a normal or steady decline of about 3%, which is really small, in exercise capacity in these Fontan patients. And so what our rule in our clinic, and this is not based on any evidence at all, is that if we see a reduction um, in the VO2 and everything else is, is equal, as you point out, of um, 10%, uh, then we will repeat that the next year, unless there's other things that are also showing that there's a change. Um, you know, other sort of uh, markers of circulation dysfunction, you know, if they have worsening symptoms, I'm more tired, I can't do stuff, or you have new arrhythmia, or we're seeing something different on the echo. And so, um, you know, and, and we get CT or MRI every three years in these patients as well. So if we're seeing other things, then we have a, then we'll sort of uh, get our heart failure colleagues involved sooner. If we're not, then we'll just repeat it and see if there's any change. Because as you point out, sometimes it's just one of those things that they had, you know, maybe they weren't exercising. But again, the good thing with the cardiopulmonary, as you know, is that you can look at all the other parameters and see, you know, was this an issue around effort or, or was it cardiac or was it respiratory, you know, and so that, that helps. So if all other things are equal, uh, then, then we would act on that. And then I'll, I'll have one follow-up question actually. Um, as you pointed out, the heart liver and when to proceed with that and when to not is very difficult and different centers do different things. In your experience, uh, what kind of percent of Fontans that you have known of that have gone for transplant at your center have gone for heart liver? Uh, none of them. So, so we, um, and, and that's not, um, uh, 
it's just, it, it has just been that the patients who have required heart transplant have not had significant liver involvement. We have one patient who um, I think ultimately will end up having heart liver and we um, had ended up referring her to uh, Toronto because she had family there and so it was easy for her from a social perspective and Toronto has done some heart liver and so we referred her not a lot though either and so we had referred her there for assessment but she and she's also incidentally as a side has hepatocellular carcinoma and so that is the one patient but our experience is not um is not large with that and if they required that it would it would likely not be pursued at our site thank you i don't see any more questions so well, thank you very much, Dr. Grewal. It was great seeing you, although you. virtually. You. Hope to see you sometime soon and take care. Thanks again. It was a fantastic talk. Okay. Thanks, everybody.